it's one of those things. It's always a fun conversation when you're when you're interviewing someone on the podcast. Like, I there's never a time when I'm not like having the time in my life. There's 365 days in the year, and if you're only spending two weeks or 14 days hunting, like there's a lot of time in there to do what you love to do. The one time I trimmed the tail feathers off of a turkey, I was legitimately in my pajama pants with no shoes on. There's no limit to what you can see out there, and just putting yourself out there, sometimes you run into the most amazing scenarios just by being persistent and putting yourself out in the woods. When my dad taught me, we used to bring in Cokes to rehydrate yourself, like like an actual Coke <laughs> instead of bringing water. It was ridiculous. That's when I realized I have to reevaluate uh, what I'm doing and and kind of make a, a few changes to my priorities. God, that mind is just a powerful tool. And when you tap into it, like, I, I, I mean, it's the whole reason I have consistent successes. I just believe in myself. I believe in the process. I'm just excited to kind of evolve this with my own personal journey. Y'all ready for your dose of flyover state spirit? Straight from the concrete jungle? Well, put down your latte and pull on your boots. It's time for Living Country in the City. Hey, y'all. Welcome to another episode of Living Country in the City. Before we get started, I want to say a big thank you to Sawyer Products for being such a big supporter of the podcast. Y'all, it's that time of year where you are going to be outdoors, you're going to be scouting, you're going to be hunting soon, and you're also going to be encountering ticks. And one of the biggest risks when it comes to ticks is Lyme disease. Make sure y'all head on over to Sawyer.com slash Lyme hyphen disease and check out all of the amazing products and resources that Sawyer has to offer to protect yourself and your family from ticks and Lyme disease. Also, just a reminder that while I've been saying this for a couple of weeks, it is still coming down the line. I've just been a little bit delayed, a little bit busy. Living Country in the City will be rebranding to the Wild Initiative, so keep an eye out for that. There's going to be a lot of cool stuff coming down the line with that, so do not be surprised when in a few weeks suddenly you are now subscribed to the Wild Initiative and no longer Living Country in the City. All right, y'all, for today's episode, I am actually going to be sharing with you a podcast that I was a guest on. Uh, The Eastman's Elevated Podcast with Brian Barney. Brian's a great guy, y'all, and we had a really fun conversation. So I hope you all enjoy episode 104 with Brian Barney from Eastman's Elevated. All right, I'm here live on uh, Eastman's Elevated. I've got Sam Ayers. Um, He runs a podcast, Living Country in the City, and uh, we finally connected to do a joint podcast. So thanks a bunch for taking the time this morning, Sam. No, my pleasure. It's always it's always fun being on this side of the mic. Isn't it? The pressure is kind of off, isn't it? When you're being interviewed, like you just tend to kind of answer the questions that come your way. Well, it's it's so fun because uh, it is. It's it's very much like I feel so relaxed right now. Versus, you know, it, it's one of those things. It's always a fun conversation when you're when you're interviewing someone on the podcast. Like I, there's never a time when I'm not like having the time of my life. But to some extent, you're sitting there and you're like, okay, I got to be thinking about what I'm going to ask next. And, you know, you're a little bit concerned with keeping the conversation going and this and that. And there's, you got a few things going on. Uh, and because, I mean, there's been people that listen to my podcast know there's been many times I've had somebody talking and, uh, you know, it's, it's somebody I'm like really learning from or whatever. And I forget that I'm interviewing them. Um, and they, they'll finish their thought and there'll just be this big, long pause to where I'm like, Oh crap, I, (laughs) I better ask them something else. Um, so it's kind of nice. Uh, I get to relax and, uh, let you do all the hard work. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's not hard on my end. We just run an authentic conversation, but you're right when it's on your podcast and you've initiated it, like, uh, you have to, to carry the conversation and also steer the conversation. You've got topics that you want to hit. But it, it's tough to transition to a different topic unless it ties together. And so, yeah, you've kind of got this balance of, of trying to, to listen and steer the conversation. I find myself every once in a while, too. Do you ever get into a thought on the podcast and you're trying to make a point and you're thinking about so many different things that I totally lose my place at what I'm talking about and I just go blank? And then I've got to just kind of talk out my own head to kind of finish some random thought. But really, I just forgot the place where I was at. Do you you ever do that on the podcast <laughs> oh constantly i i i tell stories but i tend to make my stories way too long i get into 
I had way too much detail and backstory before I ever get to the point I was trying to make. And by the time I get, I'm, I'm about four stories deep to make a certain point. And that point has long since left my head and has walked out the door and is never coming back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you get going and you get talking and then you've got to bring it back all together and tie it all back in. And sometimes you can't remember where you started or what was in the middle or what you were even talking about. But, but part of the joy is of podcasting, I guess. Hey, you know, I, we were talking earlier and it's like, you know what? It's our podcast. We can do what we want with them. If we want to go off on some long tangent and completely forget what we were talking about, well, you know, that's why people subscribe is to find is for that entertaining stuff right there. For sure. Well, and probably touched on some good topics along the way too. You know, like uh, even if you didn't hit the oh, point yeah. you were trying to make, you you probably talked about something that was interesting in there. At least that's what I hope for sometimes. Oh, yeah. Well, and so here's – let me ask you a question. How many times have you gone into a podcast expecting – you're thinking like, oh, you know, I'm going to talk about – kind of steer towards this one topic or this is what we're going to end up talking about or you make those assumptions and then you finish up the podcast. You didn't even touch on that and, and you're looking at what you guys talked about. It was great, but you're like, where on earth did that come from? Man, isn't that the truth? Like I can take notes and usually I'll touch on a few of those subjects, but very rarely do I hit all my notes. And sometimes the subject matter is totally different. Like there's a there's a flow to the conversation. And so when you get talking with somebody in this long form communication, like you just kind of go wherever the conversation leads. And I think that's part of the beauty of it, too, is that, um, you know, you may have some topics you want to touch on. And a lot of times I don't name my podcast until after I've recorded it. And I go, OK, what did we talk about? What was the most interesting point? OK, this this podcast is going to be Spring Bear this or this podcast podcast is going to be elk this but on my notes we were going to talk about mule deer the whole time or something you know <laughs> i i'm always surprised that is one of the weirdly one of the most difficult tasks sometimes for a podcast for me is coming up with some i don't know i try and probably get too clever with my names most of the time my episode names uh i should probably focus on keeping it a little more simple but that's like one of those weird weirdly difficult parts of the process for me because to some extent that's the first thing that introduces someone to the podcast it's like they'll look at the guest and then maybe they'll look at the title and, and they'll decide right then and there if they want to listen to it or not half of the time so it's I, I feel like I put maybe a little bit too much pressure on myself for that, but I don't know. <laughs> Man, you're so right, though. That title is so important to the downloads, you know, and, and you know, I'm always focused on putting out great content, great conversations, but – you know, you could have the best podcast conversation in the world, but if you give it the wrong title, it may get half the downloads or something, half the people listen to it, and it's one of the best episodes out there. And so you're right. I think it's smart to put a lot of care and a lot of thought into what your title is going to be, and not that you're trying to – I mean not that I'm trying to sell somebody a podcast that isn't good, but I'm just trying to get them interested in a good podcast, you know, so therefore I have to come up with a good title. And after you do 160 episodes or so, like you use up a lot of those good titles too, you know, <laughs> then you got to be pretty creative, but um, it does play a major role in, in how many people listen. It's just the truth of the matter. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I know just with how I listen to podcasts, I, you know, I'm not the guy, there's very few podcasts out there that I will go through and just listen to every single episode in a row because you know, as we both know and we were talking about there's so many out there right now and there are so many quality ones with great info out there and you know I probably got 17 that I subscribe to on a regular basis not even counting the little one-off ones I listen to and but I don't go through all of those I don't have the time or energy to listen to all those I'll go through and you know I may pull up Restless Native or uh, Meat Eater or The Rich Outdoors or Gritty, whatever this is, and I'll look through and I'll be like, you know, okay, I probably don't need to listen to this episode on Wild Sheep, but this episode on Mule Deer I really want to listen to. Or I may look at it and think like, you know, read this title and be like, okay, well, this is about Wild Sheep, but it, the description, you know, 
it just sounds like a fun conversation, not like it's like hunting stories versus like here's the tactics of applying for this wild sheep in this unit kind of a thing. And so I make uh, that's how I listen to it, and I pick through them like a uh, you know like a Chinese takeout menu half the time. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, it's human nature. Like, there's a few podcasts that I know are always going to be good, and I can always listen in and get you know useful information or an entertaining conversation. But you're right, I end up doing the same thing as I kind of pick and choose through. And sometimes I don't think that's always the best way to find the best podcast. Sometimes I surprise myself and I'll just listen through a podcast and the next one will automatically start. It's one I wasn't even mm -hmm. going to be interested in, but I find myself you know, in the conversation and all of a sudden I'm entertained and listening to it to squirrel hunting, which I would never be interested in. I would never choose that podcast, but all of a sudden I'm listening to squirrel hunting and I'm interested in it, you know? And so <laughs> like, like sometimes I don't think it's always the best way, but it is human nature. We can't avoid that. Oh yeah. And I'll tell you, if you ever want to talk squirrel hunting with someone, uh, you need to actually talk to my, my buddy, Brad, he, uh, he does the Restless Native podcast, and he is uh, – he's one of the co-founders of the Go Wild mobile app. Okay. Um, he is from Kentucky, and I tell you that this dude preaches the tenets of squirrel hunting. It's like his favorite thing on earth. Awesome guy. You should, uh, uh, you should check him out. I will, yeah. Um, well, it's I, – I think so much, you know, like uh, being working class and where you live – you know, I love traveling and taking these adventure hunts and going to these new habitats and new species. I mean, I absolutely love it, but it's also like enjoying what's right around you. And in the outdoors, mm -hmm. like we're so we're so fortunate to have the outdoors and, and all these things that the common guy can go do. And whether it's fishing or hunting or hunting squirrels or mule deer or bear, like I really think you have to take advantage of what's around you because you don't always have a spare week or a spare two weeks to go travel. Sometimes you just have an evening or you've got a weekend day or I know like um, I live – I live in a great place. I live just south of Bozeman in Ennis, Montana, and it's just a, a beautiful place. I'm so fortunate to be able to make a living here. I moved here like straight out of high school just because I love the outdoors, and I moved from Washington. But this place around me, like sometimes I find myself traveling too much where I have just great things around me. And like this um, – I harvested a bear on Saturday. I was able to, to arrow a good bear, but I – I'm so lucky that I can go out the evenings after work, and the evenings are the best bear hunting anyways. So that day that I harvest that bear, I woke up, I helped my wife clean the house, I hung out with the kids, we made breakfast, and then I had to go out. I had to work on some concrete counters. I've got a construction business, and so you know, I worked out in the backyard. I'm forming these things and pouring them, and then finally about 3, 4 o'clock, I go bear hunting and go cover the mountains and grab some vantage points, and sure enough, I catch a bear and able to make a good play down on him and put a perfect arrow into him, but – it, it's all just due to living in a great place or taking advantage of what's around me. And I think if squirrels are around you, you hunt squirrels. If there's fishing around you, you fish. If there's turkeys, whatever it is, like just take advantage of it and get yourself out there. I, I just believe wholeheartedly in that. Well, you know, that has been honestly one of my biggest learnings this year is I, I'm really passionate about going out and doing these big game, you know, backpack adventure hunts. And that's, that's honestly, that's my passion. That's what attracted me to hunting. And I get so excited and just pumped about that. And that's what I think about all the time. But more than that, I mean, I just, I do, I love to hunt and I have really learned this year, this past year to start taking advantage and, and look for more opportunities. You know, I'm, you know, I spent a lot more time this year, you know, <clears throat> calling predators. Uh, I've spent a lot more time this year. Uh, I, I went and spent a lot of time chasing turkeys this year. Um, you know, I have not done nearly as much fishing as I would like, but you know, the weather's nicer now, so I'm hoping to get out and do some fishing. I apparently. Uh, we have a bunch of fishing kayaks in my family's warehouse that I did not know were there. So that kind of made my day the other day discovering that's all be, you know, out on the Sacramento River fishing. And we've got like countless lakes around here that I got a pickup truck. All I got to do is throw uh, throw that one of those fishing kayaks in the back and I can be out on the water in under an hour. Um, 
And it's so that has been really something I've had to learn because when I do that, I then enjoy the bigger hunts more too. Um, one because I learned so much from those these smaller local hunts and and there's something you can learn from everything. I feel like you go out duck hunting or upland game hunting. There is stuff you learn doing that that you can apply to a backcountry elk hunt. And, and that was one thing I wish I had learned a lot sooner, you know, a couple years ago when I went on my first elk hunt. And I feel like I would have been, you know, and once again, I I would not trade the experiences I've had for anything, but I feel like I would have been a lot more successful earlier on if I had taken the time to really take advantage of these smaller hunts and rather than put all my energy and effort and focus on this one big travel adventure hunt to, uh, you know, rather than do that, uh, if I had just taken advantage, I would have, I would have found a lot more success and a lot more joy earlier on. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the journey. That's how you learn things is by trial and error, I guess. Yeah, that's it. Learning as we go. Uh, you bring up so many great points of just like skills translating to different things. Like I even find like similarities, you know, I fly fish a lot. I live on like a blue ribbon trout stream, the Madison, which is just this great river that's so unique. It has uh, so many uh, like like varied terrain, but like the fishing is really technical with a fly rod. And there's a lot of guides that fish this river, and so it gets high pressure. And so you end up kind of trying to beat the pressure. Like you'll put in at a takeout that's halfway through another put in. So you're kind of putting in halfway and you get all that water fresh or, you know, you're, you're casting your fly and putting it in a spot where 90% of anglers can't put it. And, and two, just like making a shot with a bow and arrow or a rifle where it's so like you, um, you, you have so much pressure on you and it's an adrenaline filled moment. The same way when I see like a good trout run and you're in the front of the boat, like you get one cast at that thing and you're one mend. And if you put it in the right spot and set the hook at the right time, you might just tie into 24 inches of brown, you know. But with that pressure on you, you can mess up and then you toss that fly right into the brush. You don't get the best hole in the river you've been waiting all day to fish, you know, and you, you have to float by it and bust off your fly. So I just find so many similarities, even with fishing and hunting or small game and hunting. And I just think experience is the best teacher. And when you absolutely love to do something, there's there's 365 days in the year, and if you're only spending two weeks or 14 days hunting, like there's a lot of time in there to do what you love to do. And I, I think just enjoying those little things around you and, and taking advantage of them is so important. And like I never get out there and regret my decision to go fishing or regret my decision to go hunting. It's always like I, I have to almost motivate myself like, all right, I got a few hours here. Like I, I got to get down to the river. Sure, I got to put my waders on, get my rod tied up, and I start getting lost in kind kind of the, the logistics of it. But if I just get down there and get on the river, even if I only have an hour, I'm so much happier and so grateful that I took that time and get out. I never regret taking the time and getting out there. Well, and sometimes I think we put too, like you said, you get caught up in the logistics and I think we put too much pressure on having to have everything perfect to go out and have that experience. And that was one thing, like I went and, you know, turkey hunting, for example, yeah, you're going to be a lot more successful if you're able to get out before, you know, before the sun's up and you got your full camo and your face painted and you're in a blind or you're in your spot and you're calling and everything's perfect. But, you know, I kind of realized this year, sometimes you just got to take advantage of when it comes your way. And, you know, if you're in your blue jeans and you don't have time to put on your camo, but but it's the difference between getting out and not getting out. Maybe you need to go take that imperfect hunt. And I'll be completely honest. I came a lot more close to being successful hunting turkey in my pajama pants than <laughs> I did the entire time I was in full camo. I mean, I I had some really awesome close calls, and I saw, oh, my gosh, the biggest, most beautiful boss Tom. I, it was – I was – drooling uh but he was just out of range with my shotgun um but i i did never even got a shot off on on 
one single time when I was sitting waiting in camo. But the one time I trimmed the tail feathers off of a turkey because uh, I didn't have my dang uh, rangefinder on me. Um, I was legitimately in my pajama pants with no shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was waking up. I was actually uh, messaging with a friend uh, about her turkey hunt because uh, she she had been out that early. And I I look outside. I look out and I see across the front yard. Uh, oh, like three tom, two or three toms, and a bunch of hens, and I'm like, "Well, I'm going turkey hunting." And so I throw a shirt on, <laughs> roll out in my pajama pants, and grab my bow and release in with no shoes on. And it, that was kind of a mistake. I wish I had at least put on like a pair of house slippers or Crocs or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I I go get my bow and I stand out. Uh, and I take a shot, and oh, I thought I hammered this thing. I was super stoked. Um, but uh, I, I went, and I found, uh, I shot it, and it kind of flaps up over fence into the, the neighbor's yard. Um, and I go to check my arrow. And, well, I should say, I go to check my arrow, and then I can't walk more than 10 feet because of all the stickers in the yard. So I go get some shoes, go get my arrow, and there's no blood on it, nothing. Uh, I, I went, and I. I actually kind of stalked uh i have permission for our our basically our two neighbors their uh their family and so i was kind of stalking them through front yards <laughs> in uh and uh finally came back and oh man i had like you could see right where i sheared off these tail feathers with my uh with my broadhead i actually i actually have them sitting here on the desk next to me um as a reminder to uh always have a spare rangefinder. but uh yeah so it's you know, it's it's just one of those funny things where I would have not had that experience if I had been so focused on, okay, there's turkeys out there. I need to go put on my camo, and I need to, you know, get my boots laced up, and I need to, you know, make sure everything's right, and I, or else I can't go hunting. I had the pro, I had the best time going out on that quote unquote hunt. Uh, and it was the most imperfect hunt ever, but I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. And I think, yeah, we, we get so caught up in the logistics and trying to do everything the right way that we forget, you know, sometimes you just got to go hunting. And my nephew's really good at reminding me of that. You know, he, uh, sometimes he'll just roll out, um, you know, he sees something, uh, He'll be driving and he'll see something uh, on some property he has permission to hunt, and you know he's got a shotgun locked up in the back of his truck and he'll go chasing after it and uh, it's just you know I don't know it's take the opportunities as they present themselves don't don't think they have to fit into some sort of box or uh, you know some predefined. Uh, expectation of what it exactly has to be man that's exactly right yeah um i always say like with big game hunting persistence is deadly it's just being out there it's just going giving yourself a chance and it's amazing when you put yourself in the woods what you'll see you know and a lot of times you know i'm running by the seat of my pants especially bear hunting i'm trying to work an eight ten hour day and i'm off work and i know i've got those few hours to go but you're right, like I don't have my camo on or I don't – like maybe I forgot my scope or I forgot this because I'm just running by the seat of my pants. But the – like the more you're out there, the more things just seem to happen. Like you seem to create luck, you know, and, and, and whatever it is, just trying to give yourself enough days and enough time out there and – and if you're out there enough, like you're going to run into that elk rut party. You're going to run into, you know, a, a muley. Like there's no, there's no limit to what you can see out there. And just putting yourself out there, sometimes you run into the most amazing scenarios just by being persistent and putting yourself out in the woods. Oh, without a doubt. And I mean, to some extent, you know, we make our own luck. Uh, you know, luck is made by preparation and. Uh, time in the field and but it, it comes down to to some extent there always is an element of actual luck all the preparation in the world is not going to suddenly make the elk show up exactly where you need them to be at the exact amount of at the exact time the likelihood's a lot higher like you know say you did that scouting 
and you know you did that scouting you did all that prep and they should be here but you know what it comes down to luck whether or not they're going to be there and the more you're in the field and the more time you're spending out there there's a higher percentage that luck is going to turn your way and uh you know once again uh what's the what's the saying if they're not flying they're not dying if you're not out in the field you know you're you've got to put it out there if you want it to work out and you know i mean stuff's stuff's not going to die if you're not shooting your bow you're never going to see anything if you're not in the field so man that's it and like um yeah and it's just effort like that preparation preparing yourself your shooting physical shape all of that is so important the scouting the e scouting and, and then it's also important to get there and put forth the effort and sometimes you know, you get caught up in, oh, this spot isn't producing, I'm not seeing any sign, I should be in this other spot. But just putting forth that effort, time in and time out, it equals luck. It equals, like, consistent success can't just come down to luck. It comes down to, to effort and time, and, and what you put into it is what you get out of it. And you're right is that you do need a lucky break. You do need to catch something in a certain spot, or you need to see something – but boy, if you walk around enough, it doesn't matter how unlucky you are. You are going to catch a, a trophy animal. You're going to catch an animal that you want to chase and get an opportunity. And then it's up to you to get it done. But I, I just think you couldn't say it better. Like you, you create your own luck by being out there and putting in the effort. It's, you know, and and it's back to like like we've been talking. You know, take advantage of those those hunts when they come along. Um, uh, the more you're out in the field is is really what it comes down to. I mean, get those opportunities, whether they're big, small, uh, you know, to scout, to see animals, to that's I'm I'm terrible at that. You know, a lot of it is be, just because of the distance for me, but I, I am so terrible at ta making the time to go scout. Um and I, I'll admit some of that is because uh, I look at that. I'm like, okay, I could go out and do this this other hunt, or I could go scout for my big hunt. I need to get better about taking the time in the field to scout for sure. Um, but uh, you know, just get out, get out as much as you can. Um, you know, that has been such a big, big, big learning for me. Uh, and I still don't do it enough. Do you ever do you ever find that sometimes you have to make the decision? Um, you're like, OK, is it the podcast or is it actually hunting? Am I going to talk about hunting for uh, this week or am I actually going to go hunt? <laughs> Do you ever run into that? Well, un unfortunately, I do every now and again because the podcast is such a priority for me. But I believe my podcast is popular because I hunt so much and I have so much information to share. So I always try to put priority on hunting but and try to get my podcast done in my free time. But, yeah, there has definitely been some scenarios. Like my buddy Dan came down last year to go bear hunting and – I had to record a podcast. I had it scheduled, and so I couldn't hunt with them the first evening, but then I was going to hunt with them for three days. And so we sat out, and we talked, and we made them a game plan. I'm like, man, Dan, I just can't go with you tonight, but this is the vantage point I'd sit – I'd look at these spots and you probably catch one. The grass is right. I got to record this podcast. So I hop on the podcast and as soon as I'm off the podcast, I got text rolling in and sure enough, Dan went to that vantage point, spotted the, this great cinnamon bear across the way, you know, went down oh. in there, made his stock, shot the bear. And, th and then it got sketchy, ran into another bear in the darkness. And I, you know, I didn't know where he was up on the hill. So it turned into a whole ordeal. He didn't have a pistol or bear spray because he was running by the seat of his pants too like just got off work drove down to my valley went hunting and so you know he didn't have any of the stuff he needed and so it got a little sketchy in there but yeah he arrowed a beautiful cinnamon bear and uh i was stuck on the podcast so yeah that that does happen to me <laughs> because they are such huge priorities in my life you know but yeah i try to hunt as much as i can but that's that that tough decision making and whether it's the podcast, whether it's my construction job or whether it's my family or hunting, it's tough to have a balance in your life and you can't 
Like you have to have a balance because how you do one thing is how you do everything, and you can't um, you know neglect being a good father or a good husband to be a good hunter. That doesn't work either. And so you've got to really find that balance and then just try to take advantage of that time as you can, I think. At least that's the answer for me. No, it's and uh, that is something I definitely struggle with is finding that balance. And I think it's very easy, you know, you don't if you don't focus on keeping that balance, it's very easy to get burnt out on one thing or another. And uh, there's those times when you know there'll there'll be times like when it, it's late, and you know I try and release uh, once a week, and I try and do it on you know at the beginning of the week, every week. And there's times on like a Saturday, Saturday night or something where I'm trying to, where it's getting late or like, I want to go out and hang out with some, with some friends or something or, or do something social, but I'm looking and I'm like, oh man, okay. I got to make a decision here. Do I want to go out or, or do I need to release this podcast? And, and there'll be times where, you know, it kind of feels like work at that point. Um, and there are other times where I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to have to suck it up and do it. And, or, or, you know, there's, there's always a, always an option, you know, sometimes I'll go out, sometimes I don't. Um, but it's, it's tough to achieve that balance and not feel burnt out on one thing or another. And, um, and I think it's just focusing on our reasons behind doing this, you know, uh, being able to talk to these cool people, um, and really learn from them. And I have to remind myself, you know, this, this podcast for me is to document what I'm doing and to, and find, and to find more ways to hunt and to learn more about hunting. Um, and so when I lose sight of that, I have to, that's when I realize I have to reevaluate what, uh, what I'm doing and, and kind of make a, a few changes to my priorities. That's so introspective and self-evaluation is so important. I, I think you bring up some good points in that those responsibilities, they sure get in the way of good hunting sometimes. Like I, I find myself in the fall, I'll get a little overwhelmed too, just because I am trying to hunt so much and I have these goals and I've been working so hard on them. You know, I've been running marathons and ultra marathons to train, running day in, day out, running hills and shooting my bow nonstop. I've been dreaming about this hunt for an entire year and I plan my block of time, but yeah, once you start stacking these hunts up in the fall, you know, I start losing time for recordings or it's tough to connect with people. And so, yeah, I start feeling that stress for sure. Um, I, I think the biggest thing for me too, and I'm constantly working at it, is just being as productive with my time as I can, you know, is like not getting lost in my phone, you know, making sure I'm you know, if I want to go bear hunting in the evening, well, I better wake up early and get this podcast work done and then get to my day job and I better get this done, you know, and, and, and then I, you know, come home and have dinner quick and I'm out the door. That way I'm spending time with my family, hearing about their day. But it's so much of it is just being productive with my time. It seems like I may only have a few hours of work, but sometimes like procrastination and just not getting started on it or not being productive or wasting an hour in the morning having my coffee, it's all time that I could spend and getting things done that'll give me more free time to be out in the woods. And so I'm just constantly evaluating my time, trying to be more efficient and more effective with it to where I'm just really focused on getting things done, checking things off my list. And then that means I have more free time. And if I really focus on it, then yeah, I can go bear hunting in the evening or go fishing in the evening. But if I drag my feet or I wake up late or I don't get started right away, well then, you know, I've got to spend that evening working on stuff that I didn't get done throughout the day. So that that's a big thing for me is to just to try to be productive with my time. Oh, without a doubt. I, I've i lost so much time to you. whether it's, you know, sitting down at the breakfast table with my coffee and browsing Instagram or playing some stupid iPhone game. And all of a sudden I look up and, you know, it I, 45 minutes have gone by and I, I'm now like, well, crap, now I have to rush to get everything done I need to in the morning. And um, I, I've actually moved uh, all my coffee stuff into my into my office studio area that I've kind of put together. So at least that way now um, I'm more 
it pushes me a little bit more to come in here and I'll grab my coffee and sit down and start answering emails or whatever instead of playing those games. And I try and find uh, find those efficiencies where I can and, um, you know, find ways to uh, to really maximize the amount of time so I'm not feeling – so th- I, I look at where those distractions come and and where uh, where I find myself losing the time the most, and I try and figure out a way to prevent myself from doing that or at least turn that distracted time in- into something productive, whether that's, you know, answering emails or, um, you know, making sure my laptop is right there so I can, uh, you know, put together a podcast cover um, – you know, when I have a couple of those extra seconds, all, uh, all of that, all of that stuff, um, you know, say I'm with family and want to, uh, and they all want to watch a movie. Well, okay. If we're watching a movie though, I'll have my laptop on the dim setting and I'll be, I'll be writing up, uh, you know, writing up an email or like I said, you know, editing some photos or who knows, you know, so I'm trying, I'm trying. There's a lot of, a lot of work. Yeah, it sounds like you do a good job of it. I'm going to steal that. I love that coffee in the office. I don't know why it's so tough for me to get to my office. It's just downstairs. It's not that far of a walk. It's not that hard to do. But if I can just get in here and sit down, I get stuff done. But for some reason, I'll just procrastinate getting down here, you know? And so I I think that's a great tip to have your coffee stuff in your office, which just gets you in that space. And sure, you may sit there for five minutes and sip on your coffee. But if you're in front of that computer, you're just going to get started with your day and started with the work that needs to get done. I really like that tip, Sam. Oh yeah. It's, uh, it was, yes, yeah, just one of those weird little things. And, you know, I finally bought the amount, it's bizarre. The amount of productivity I have gotten because I bought a little mini fridge and keep it in my office now with, I've got, uh, you know, whatever my coffee creamers in there, but I've got like a bunch of snacks. I've got a bunch of waters, got a, cu- a, a few beers in there and, the amount of that just buying that stupid little mini fridge has increased my productivity. It is ridiculous because I didn't realize how much time I would spend like running back to the house to grab something to eat or uh, so many times I get distracted just because I'm hungry. But then <laughs> I go into the house to get some food and I see something and I go to clean up this thing and or, you know, who knows? Um it's, it blows me away the amount that that has increased my productivity, and it also just keeps me in the office a little bit longer uh, to, you know, to do that work. But I don't know, man. Finding more ways to finding more ways to uh, talk with smart people, more ways to get out hunting, and uh, more ways to uh, get the content out there. Yeah, that's the truth, man. That's a great life hack. Just the, um, I think too, as you're hunting, being prepared to, like, just having snacks in the truck and and bringing some stuff from home. It seems like if you go out for an entire day, you know, if you've got everything you need, some snacks in there and a drink, and you know, you're sitting pretty good and you can spend the whole day out there. But if you don't and you you just go out there and you plan on spending the whole day, you start getting pretty hungry about two, three o'clock, and you're like, well. I haven't seen anything all day. I, I got to get some food in me or I got to go do this. And then your day's <laughs> shot. Like like just being prepared um, and you can't have a mini fridge with you all the time, but just to have a few little items, I think it keeps you out in the field longer. Oh, man, that's one thing. Uh, my buddies down in Arizona, I know they have learned about me. Uh, I think our first time out hunting, uh, you know, I don't think they – had any idea i am such a snacker i eat constantly on hunts um i i would honestly probably say a good a good chunk of the percentage of weight in my pack at any given time is food like i i i have to eat all the time and i just get so I am it affect I'm I'm the quintessential like hangry person. It affects my mood, my mental state. Like when I am hungry, like it it is a huge difference between me being able to like push through frustration and disappointment and stuff on a hunt. Uh 
something as simple as like a little snack bar, um, just being able to snack all the time is weird, makes a weird amount of difference between me being able to like push through and in and mentally and versus like just wanting to go back to the tent and crash. It's crazy how much that affects me. Yeah, it sounds small, but you're so right. You're on such a calorie deficit when you're out on a backcountry hunt like your backpack hunts. You are burning so many calories. I mean, you're mountaineering with a bow in your hands, you know, and so like you can't eat enough to to make up that calorie deficit. But just having food and being able to fuel your system I, I don't – it's like a – it's almost too like a like a comfort too, like knowing you've got a little food in there and, oh, I can have a little snack while I'm sitting on the vantage point. Instead, like if, if you're hungry, like it's in our nature, like that's the only thing we can think about. And especially if you're not seeing something or not on a stock, it, it's easy to, to not keep putting the effort forth or – um and and just having a snack it's just like a creature comfort it's just a a little something there that where, where you can eat continue to fuel yourself and you feel good and can continue to be focused on the hunt oh yeah it's uh i don't know it's that mental toughness uh it <laughs> gets affected by by so many things you know and for me it's definitely food is i don't know that's a that's a big one. I uh, I invest quite a bit in snacks and food for the backcountry. <laughs> Man, it's Non-stop. a learning process, isn't it? When you're backpacking like that, um, to have enough food for the entire trip to fuel yourself. And we're all individuals and need different things. But man, it's a learning process, and and that's my bread and butter too. Just like you talked about your passion is these backpack hunts. That's me too. I love these these grueling uh, backpack hunts where I can disappear in the wilderness. I love them solo or with buddies. Um, but but the food has definitely been a learning process. You know, I remember when I first started. I was going to go on an elk hunt, and um, you know, I was I was fairly young, and I'd done a little backpacking with my dad and whatnot, and some shorter trips. But this trip, I was going to go for you know a week, seven, eight, nine days for elk or whatever, and disappear in the mountains. And so, you know, I was trying to look at my food, and I didn't know anything about backcountry hunting. In fact, you know, when my when my dad taught me, we used to bring in cokes to rehydrate yourself, like like an actual coke instead of bringing water. It was ridiculous, and Twinkies and just all kinds of stuff. So I just had no idea. I had to learn through experience, and so I thought, okay, for this hunt, I'm gonna bring a Cliff Bar for morning, a Cliff Bar for for lunch, and then I'll bring a Mountain House for dinner. And then I tried to sustain that for eight nine days. To this day, I have not had another cliff bar. Like, I made myself so sick off those things because that's all I had to oh, eat. Man. Like, it's so important to have variety and things that taste good, things that you crave in the backcountry. And, and also, like, I, I'm i not a fan of the dehydrated meals or the freeze-dried meals. Like, I had those for a while, but I, I hunt so much backcountry. I just got burned out of those things, and then they don't sit real good in my system. I don't feel real good when I'm eating them. So it's been a real challenge for me, but I try to shoot like in between two to three thousand calories a day, and I try to take a Ziploc for each day and package that up. You know, that way too, I'm kind of rationing out, and I still have good food on day seven. I didn't eat it all in the first couple of days, and so <laughs> I try to make like a one Ziploc is one day, and then I pack that full. I usually end up about twenty two, twenty four hundred calories. Some days can be twenty eight hundred calories or whatever it is. But that seems to be about my happy spot. And then if I'm going for eight days, I'll pack seven days worth of food because I know I'll have some extra stuff left over where I can make that eighth day work. But, um, yeah, it's an evolution just trying to figure out your system just to sustain yourself in the backcountry to continue hunting. Well, there's times, too, where it's like you know you need to eat. You know it's affecting you, but it's it's tough and – you know, I'm I'm one of those people. I can eat the same thing day after day after day if I need to. But there are just some times where you're like, okay, you know, I know I need to to eat this. I mean, it's just like I'm so tired. I'm not hungry at all. Um, but I know it's gonna just kill me if I don't if I don't eat this. And um, you know, or there's just some times too where I've realized like there's certain things I cannot eat when I'm in the backcountry, like. I can eat them all day long when I'm at home, but if I'm like hiking and in the backcountry, it is just 
like uh, like nut mixes for me like trail not like trail mix but like if i like a thing of mixed nuts like i i tried one time bringing these packages thinking like okay you know it's got a bunch of macadamia nuts in it high calories you know high fats this will be great for me um and i just wouldn't eat it i i it like did not sound appealing to me in the slightest um and because of that i wasn't eating anything basically yeah uh, well, I mean, you know i had my my meals but those were like my snacks and i just wouldn't even touch them man if it doesn't sound good in the backcountry you just don't get into it and it's so important to keep fueling yourself the right way and i'm the same way like i've, I've just found that there's things that it may be healthy for me or good for me but if i don't want to eat it or crave it like in most of these backpack hunts are at high elevation and high elevation you know it's an appetite suppressant so you're not as hungry and plus you're putting so much effort forth you're hiking so much that yeah a lot of times you just don't feel like eating which deteriorates your your, your physical state and your mental state even more where you just got to continue fueling yourself so yeah you got to find what food works for you and what foods appealing and then i also have a couple foods that i just won't eat like um like uh, pepperoni sticks or oysters or uh, smoked salmon. Well, what I end up doing is I end up eating that and then belching it for the next day or the next half a day as I'm hiking oh, around oh, yeah. and feeling horrible. And I'm like, okay, mark that off the list, never bringing that again. But yeah, you got to find the food that works for you and be creative and try things in the off season. And I also try not to get too healthy with my food or I just won't eat it. And and eating, you know, something with a little bit more sugars in it or something is way better for me than not eating at all, you know. And so I just try to pick food that tastes good, that I like, that I'm going to crave in the backcountry that I'll eat, you know, and, and still like to have the right balance of proteins and fats and sugars and things. But But I don't go overboard trying to plan it out to eat the healthiest meal up there. And the truth of the matter is, is you're burning so many calories. And like I know these people that are running the ultra marathons and the marathons and and i run a ton of miles like you're just burning those calories off i've seen some of the best ultra uh, marathon runners that are eating oreos and drinking coke is their diet for the run you know they're just trying to fuel themselves to keep putting that energy forth and your body just turns that sugar into energy and i you know i'm not saying eat oreos and coke when you're out hunting the whole time <laughs> but i think there's a balance between tw taste and nutrition and, and i think when you're out there burning those calories you know you can have a a little bit of junk food here or there and it's not going to kill you oh yeah i've always you know that's, that's the other thing i've started always doing is those little uh those little packages of uh of like fruit snacks or something that you know you would get in your lunch as a kid uh i always i always make sure to have uh one of those you know i don't I don't get the big old bag of Skittles necessarily, but I always have at least one of those little packages of fruit snacks because same kind of thing. It just affects my mental state so much when, you know, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, and I'm kind of sitting there and I'm like, I don't want to eat anything, but I just kind of want something to to cheer me up a little bit, and I'll eat those or, you know, it's just I'll, I'll have a little bit of dessert after my meal whenever I happen to have that, you know. Um it's crazy how it affects you, for sure. Man, I'm with you. I'm a grown man, and I will murder some fruit snacks in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> My kids' food is not safe in the house if I'm going hunting, for sure. Um, yeah, it does. It does give you – it gives you a little edge mentally, and so much of this hunting and backcountry hunting – it so comes back to, to mental toughness and, and keeping the course, and, and the brain is just like it's – it's such a powerful tool and it can it can be your best friend or your worst enemy. It can turn on you on a dime and kind of get in control of that. Like I train my you know, my mental state and my off season a lot with my training or like we were talking about scouting earlier, how um you were talking about having to scout more. I know scouting is a huge confidence booster for me and a lot of times I use my scouting, you know, to locate animals, to get familiar with the country. But I also use it to backpack for three days and put on grueling miles and live out of a tent, live with backpacking food. Like I'm just getting comfortable in the mountains again, you know. And so like I use those scouting trips for that too. But yeah, I just – there's – um there's so hunting success directly ties to your mental state and life in general. It's 
it's just so mental and and the body will do what the mind tells it and you need to be in good physical shape where you don't have limitations as well but god that mind is just a powerful tool and when you tap into it like i i, I mean it's the whole reason i have consistent success is i just believe in myself i believe in the process believe on keep putting the effort forth and then i've just i've sharpened my mind through all these tough backcountry hunts and then all the miles I run day in, day out, getting on the trails and, and, and putting those forth, like I, I've just sharpened my mind to where I know I can count on it in tough situations and my mind will get me through, you know, it's such a, a huge part, a huge facet of being successful, I think. No, without a, without a doubt. And that's, it's probably one of the hardest things to develop. I mean, really the only way to develop it's it's like a muscle you know the only way to develop it is to put yourself in situations that are going to test your mental toughness and stretch it and honestly completely break it down you know you're not going to grow that mental toughness if you're not going beyond your limits of mental toughness just like you know, uh, with weights, you know, you, to build up your muscles, you need to tear them down beyond, you know, what they can really naturally handle. Um, and it, they kind of grow. I mean, you know, somebody is probably going to uh, email me about <laughs> my uh, my uh, technical terminology. But basically, you know, it's going to grow back stronger and bigger and tougher. Um, and, you know, mental toughness, toughness is just like that. But I feel like it's a lot – putting yourself in situations that uh, that stretch your mental toughness, I feel like, is a lot more difficult than putting yourself in situations that stretch your physical toughness. Man, you're so spot on, Sam. Like we grow through struggle, putting ourselves in those situations and putting past our limits. And we're capable of so much more than we even know. Like the human body and the human mind, like like you'll tap in, you'll tap out and, and and stop the pain way before what you're capable of. And it always surprises me, like what you can actually do when faced with that task. And I, you know, whether it's pack outs or days on end or back to back hunts or like just the other day on that bear i harvested that bear it was a solo hunt harvested a really good bear and i mean i was all the way down in this canyon um you know skin the whole thing process all the meat um able to take some of the fat and render some of the fat but i got everything all processed and then i boned the meat off the quarters to make it as light as i could and um, I got all done. It was 10 o'clock at night. And here in Montana, you know, there isn't just black bears. We're in grizzly country, you know. And so it's 10 o'clock at night. I mean, I've got four or five hours. I've got to hike out 2,000 feet of elevation. I've got to hike a few miles, get to my bike, and then ride out a few more miles all in the dark. And then plus I'm trying to one trip out this bear. And when I picked up that pack, like it was a big bear I didn't weigh the pack when I got home. I know it was well over 100 pounds. It was 120, 130 pounds. Like I, I'm, I'm Eesh. only five seven, 150 pounds, but I just know what I'm capable of, and I know I've trained so hard all year that like I could two trip this bear, but I'm just gonna hike him out of here. And yeah, at times it was only 10 to 20 steps, take a break. 10 to 20 steps, take a break. But to hike it out this 2,000 vertical, it's pouring down rain. You're hearing noises in the middle of the night. Like that tests me, you know, but I got the barrel out. I got home. It was three o'clock in the morning and you tend to forget like the bad times on a hunt and remember the good times. But for me, those challenging situations in that hunt, it means everything to me. Like I, I absolutely love pushing myself and finding where my limits are. But when I picked up that pack at the bottom of that Canyon, like, um, you know, a younger me may have doubted I could even get that pack out of there. But when I put that pack on, I know I've done worse hikes than that. I know I've done worse pack outs than that. I know my body's capable. I've been training all year. There wasn't a doubt in my mind. Like, I'm going to climb this up this 2,000 feet. I'm going to hike it back to my bike. I'm going to bike it out. Like, I just believe in myself because I've put myself in these tough situations or this struggle before. But, yeah, I just I – just, um, I don't think we can put enough emphasis on how important uh, mental toughness is to being successful in, in not only hunting, but all of life, really. Oh, it's I, – I've had this discussion with a few people on the podcast before. There is so much 
hunting in and of itself, especially, uh, you know, when you're really into these, you know, adventure and backpack hunts, um, it's such a lifestyle and in and of itself, but it affects everything to do with your life. I mean, it, uh, it, these lessons you learn and like you said, this mental toughness you develop and it, it, it really does um, translate into so many different aspects of your life. And I feel like uh, it's such a positive thing. I really, I mean, I don't see, I look back at, at what I've learned from hunting and all of this, and I don't see any negative aspect. I don't see any way that it has not positively affected my life. Man, that's so cool. And I, like for us guys, I just think to have something that you love to do and to have passion in your life and to fall in love with this this backcountry bow hunting and the process and and all the 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 practice and determination and 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 discipline it takes to continue working hard towards your goals, it's just made me so much better at life. I don't know where I'd be in life if I didn't have hunting because it like you talked about at the beginning of the podcast, it's what you think about every day. That's like me too. I think about it every day. I work hard towards my goals every day. But you know, now I'm um, 39 years old, and, and and I'm in the best shape of my life because of hunting. Because I know I need to constantly prepare. And when you're prepared, and when you're in shape, and when you're mentally tough, man, you enjoy. Like you, you enjoy these backcountry hunts that much more and having confidence in yourself and in your skills, knowing that you're prepared, knowing that you can do it. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's been absolutely life changing for me. And, and then like you say, I just translate that in all the other aspects of my life. And all of a sudden I have a problem at work. It's not that big a deal. It's not like I got to climb out of a Canyon 2000 feet with a bear and go through grizzly country for five hours. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just not that big of a deal. Like when you, because so much in life, we don't get to face life and death and sure it's dangerous driving in our cars, you know, every day is probably the most dangerous things that you do. But when you're on a back country hunt like man it's in the forefront of your mind whether you're in grizzly country whether it's you know getting you you're concerned about getting lost or getting turned around or storm that may come in or lightning or rain or whatever it is but it's just right in the forefront of your mind it's right in your face your personal safety relies upon your own skills that you have to keep yourself safe and i i just love that like being faced with that then you can come back to life and go well this isn't really a big deal this isn't life or death like i'll just figure it out and so many times in life like it's just how you go about those problems like you can stress out about it and think about it and come up with worst case scenarios and and you can ruin yourself with stress for a week thinking over this problem but the right way to do it <laughs> is to like think of this problem think about moving forward what your options are and what the best course of actions are and then you go forward with those courses of actions and you don't worry about it like you just make a decision and go this is my this is my best course of action this is what I'm going to do and I think hunting gives you that perspective like those mountains give you that perspective i think do you find that oh without a doubt um i don't know there's just something <sighs> i don't even know how to say it but um there's nothing hey I, I just exactly what you said there's nothing like the mountains to give you that perspective it's yeah. really true well, you come back and water out of your faucet tastes good again. Like all this stuff you take for granted, like driving in your car, the, you know, water coming out of your sink, like having a house to protect Turning you. Turning on a storm. light switch. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> it does. It gives you so much perspective. You come back and all of a sudden you appreciate electricity and you hadn't thought, an elect thought about electricity for 10 years, you know, but all of a sudden you come back from a hunt. You're like, man, this is amazing. I live in this place. This is crazy. And. I even notice like the inside of my house, like I come home and, and I built this whole house evenings and weekends. Um, and, and so I have a lot of pride in this house that I built too. But all of a sudden I come home and I appreciate my woodwork more and my rock work and my <laughs> wood floors. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. I live here. This is my house. But yet yeah, it, it does give us such perspective in our life. And I, I, I just think it's so important and, and uh, that, that us guys are so fortunate that we found it, you know. No, without a doubt, it is – oh, man. I want to get out now. <laughs> I, want to, 
I'm gonna go on a hike or something right now. Good, me too. Yeah. Um. Well, I I burned up a ton of your time, but what what hunts do you got coming up? Um. This year, Sam, have you drawn any tags yet? I have. Um. So I've always got. Uh, I always pick up that over the counter archery uh, deer tag in Arizona. Um. That uh. You know, you, you put in. It's probably the most underrated tag in the United States, as far as I'm concerned. Um. It's, you know, and so I'll be down uh, probably August. I'll be down uh, chasing some mule deer for a little bit in, in Arizona, and I drew uh, Montana this year. So I am very excited to uh, head out and see what Montana has to offer. So I'll be chasing elk in Montana, and uh, plan is also to try and hit up uh, some – an over-the-counter elk tag in Idaho. So kind of my goal this year is I want to – basically, I want to I want to hit Idaho, and I want to, I, I want to get an elk. Cow elk, a spike, a bull, literally whatever elk is willing to show its face so I can put it in the freezer. And then I want to uh, – I kind of want to head over to Montana – and then spend the rest of the year hunting as much as I can in Montana to get, you know, maybe a bigger bowl or, you know, uh, really have that, have that time to just hunt and enjoy the hunt and spend as much time out in the field as I possibly can. Um, so those are the only things currently officially on the docket I'll be doing you know, I'll, I'll of course probably be doing some some deer hunting uh, here in California when the season opens uh, for some blacktail. I'll be uh, I'm really really excited about fall bear this year. You know, we don't have spring beer. Spring beer. <laughs> there was pl- there's been plenty of spring beer. <laughs> um, spring spring bear. Uh, we don't have spring bear here in California, which is which is a bummer. And uh, I was kind of hoping to. Uh, to get out somewhere, but I just didn't have the time uh, this year to chase spring bear. So I'm excited for fall. I've always really, for me, ever since I started getting interested in hunting, archery bear is like the epitome of hunting for me, you know, and I, I really would like to get a black bear this year. My, my absolute all time, just mind blown dream hunt would be um, an Alaskan brown, brown bear with my bow. Uh, I don't think I'm quite ready for that just yet, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm super excited to, uh, and I, I really would like to get a black bear this year with my bow. Um, so that's kind of another one of my big goals and plenty of predator hunting to do and, and whatever else rears its head. I am, I'm spending as much time as possible out hunting. So, man, how cool you got a bunch of cool adventures planned. Um, Gosh, yeah, uh, it sounds awesome. Idaho has such great population, so many great places to hunt for elk, dude. You're gonna have a blast there, and uh, we'll talk after the podcast too. And any information I can give you to kind of help out. And then I, I live here in Montana, and so can definitely help you out here in Montana, or you have a place to stay, or even if you want to join in on camp. And then what you should do too is, um, like for bear, is Idaho in a lot of those units has a forty dollar bear tag. And you already have your license and your elk tag. You just pick up a bear tag. And in the fall, I run into bears elk hunting quite a bit. Um, you know, and also where you're at too, like next year, you should plan a spring trip to Idaho, especially if you're hunting elk there, you already have the $150 license. It's a $40 license for bear and you can get two of them in a lot of those areas and they're, they're full of bears. Mm -hmm. And so that would add like a springtime hunt for you. But yeah, definitely pick up a bear tag while you're in Idaho, man, that hunting those, Grizzlies would be my ultimate too. I, I'm just not quite in the right tax bracket, or you know, I, I <laughs> like so like I got into hunting bears and and I got into hunting them with my bow. And it's black bears are entry level to dangerous game, man. It is so thrilling. Like I'll, I call bear hunting. 99% boredom and 1% thrilling excitement, man. It is so cool to stock up on those <laughs> things. Um, so that's what I do all spring long and it's an open rifle season here but I hunt with my bow um all season. So, you know, I've been I've mentioned that bear it's so fresh in my mind cuz I I just harvested him on Saturday. 
Um, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I got that one with my bow. Really nice bore, nice big head on them. But that one got sketchy. So I snuck up. I spotted them. I hit this evening vantage point, and I glassed across, and I saw this bear. And it's a it's a blonde boar. And blondes is like the rarest of color phases in black bears. It's a double recessive gene where they got to throw two recessive genes to have an actual blonde bear. Um, so this bear is blonde, and I see him down there. And I've seen quite a few blonde bears. In fact, in my area, 10 to 20% of the bears are blonde, but it's really tough to find a good boar that's blonde. And so I see him, I evaluate him, I said, yeah, that's a shooter bear. And so I went for him. And bears, you're always sending it. Like you, you never see him 100 yards off. You always see him like a couple miles off. And so this one's all the way down this canyon, which, which I've described. And so I run down the 2000 vertical feet. He's just in the perfect place. Wind coming downhill. I've got a great approach. And so I snuck up to where he should be. Wind's coming down at me and I'm just creeping up and I know he's right over the rise, but to see over the rise, I've got to get really close. Well, I get in really close and he's at like 30 yards and he's feeding in this grass and I've got my bow. And I draw once on him when he's broadside, and then he kind of turns facing towards me as I'm drawn, but with his head down eating grass, and so I let down. And then I wait, and I've got to wait like three, four minutes inside bow range, and I'm just like, please. If the wind keeps, I'm going to kill this bear. If the wind switches at all, he's going to be out of here. And so I'm just sitting. Uh I'm kind of kneeled down below the rise of the hill, and I can just kind of see his back feeding and then all of a sudden he gets broadside to me and he's just broadside feeding and I draw back settle my pin and execute just a perfect shot I couldn't have walked up and placed that arrow any better right behind the front shoulder (laughs) halfway up the body and man every time I shoot a bear once you shoot a bear with a bow and arrow like you're inside the fight or flight range of a bear so I'm at 28 yards when I shot him and then after you shoot a bear with a bow, you always go, oh, shit, what did I do? <laughs> like, like it's yeah. like it's mass chaos. So I hit this bear, and, man, he growls and barks and starts biting at the arrow and roaring, and I'm going, oh, no, what did I just do, you know? Oh, and man. I'm 28 yards away, and I'm downhill. Like, I'm where this bear wants to run. And so, you know, a few years ago, I made the decision to always have my pistol when I'm bear hunting because I just have a responsibility to come back safe and sound for my family. So I pull out my pistol. It's like a Glock uh, 10 millimeter with 15 rounds. And I pull out my pistol. So I got my bow in one hand, my pistol in the other hand. And then this bear's spinning around and growling and biting. And I'm starting to back up. And I actually set my bow on the ground so I could get two hands on my pistol. And then that bear mm-hmm. came right at me. Like, and so I oh, started my unloading my gun, like throwing lead his direction. I'll tell you, I wasn't the best shot with my pistol. I need to practice more with it. So it's like second nature, like my bow. Um, but I hit him two times, grazed him once, finally dropped him. I dropped him like five yards away from me right there. This big blonde boy, like you want to talk about excitement Ooh. and dangerous game, dude. It was as thrilling as it gets. It, it was, um, it was a pretty cool experience. And so, yeah, that, that was my bear hunt that just went down a couple of days ago that I'm still reeling from. And so I actually captured it to like, I did an Instagram story as I'm out hunting here and there and kind of recalled the situation. I didn't get film of the charge or the shot, but it's all kind of there. And I saved it in my favorites there on the Eastman's elevated page, but man, it's pretty thrilling encounter. So, um, for a guy like you that wants to hunt the grizzly bears, the black bears are the entry level dangerous game. So yeah, man, you got to get into it this fall. Oh, yeah. You you got to get some stocks on them and um yeah, let's connect when you're out here in Idaho, Montana next year and see if we can um find you a bear or find you an elk out here. That man would be really fun. Oh, I would absolutely love that for sure. Yeah, I uh we'll uh we'll chat a little bit later. I'll let you know uh the the tags I've got or the tag I've got for Montana. And, uh, I'm hoping, you know, we got some great black bear populations. I'm up here in Northern California now. uh, Um, and I'm not sure if I told you that, that I have, uh, that I officially moved out of Los Angeles. Um, so I, uh, I'm not quite living country in the city anymore, (laughs) Um, but, uh, yeah, up here in Northern California, we have some incredible black bear populations and, uh, I've, I've got some friends that hunt them, and uh, so I'm hoping, too, to get some time even here in California. Um, you know, there's – within within a three-, four-hour drive, you know, I can be way up in into some serious black bear territory. And like I said, I got some friends that that's 
what they love to do. And so I'm hoping to maybe get one out here. So this may be, this may be a good year for, uh, for more than one black bear encounter. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, good for you moving to Northern Montana, getting out of the city a little bit where you can enjoy things around you a little <laughs> bit more. How cool. And, um, yeah, I wish I was in Northern, I wish I was in Northern Montana, but Northern California for now. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Did I say Montana? I meant California. But yeah, that Northern California. You guys do have a great population of bears and big ones. They get big heads out there and a lot of really good color phase uh, chocolates and blondes and things. So yeah, you're right. You got a great opportunity right out your back door there. So yeah, um, you're gonna have a good fall. It sounds like you've got a bunch of hunts planned. Oh yeah, and if you don't, if you don't mind me. Uh doing a little promo here um with with that move uh you know i i just announced on episode 100 of of my podcast uh i'm actually going to be rebranding living country in the city um i just you know i moved out of la moved to northern california and uh to be honest living country in the city is a bit of a mouthful <laughs> um and, and it it's uh it's very it kind of pigeonholes me a little bit, and um, I wanted to pick a new name that's a little more authentic now to what I'm doing and uh, where I'm headed and really that still speaks to where I came from. And so I am going to be in the next few weeks renaming the podcast, renaming the brand to The Wild Initiative. Um, so I'm I'm really, really excited about that. It's kind of, you know uh, – an initiative I'm taking on. So, <laughs> dude, that's great, Sam. Um, yeah, how awesome to to kind of change and evolve the podcast as you change and evolve. And um, man, I'm I'm a big fan of your your podcast. I think you put out great content, and I think it's so important what you're doing. Like, um, you know, and the way you do your podcast, like people really get to know you and get to know your personality. But I really think like, even with that first title, like you're reaching more, you know, first time hunters or people that do live in cities and trying to give them opportunities to get out and enjoy these wild public lands that we have and saying, you know, here's me. I, you know, when you did live in LA, it's like, here's me. I live in the city, but look at all these cool things I can go and enjoy and sharing those experiences mm -hmm. and those hunts that you do. I think it'd been so beneficial for guys that would normally not get introduced to the outdoor lifestyle. So, man, I think it's so cool. And congratulations on the, the rebranding and the success of your podcast. Um, man, you're just doing a lot of cool things. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'm looking, you know, looking to do the same thing. Nothing's really going to be changing much except for the name and hopefully, uh, hopefully going to be putting out just even more, uh, even more content for everyone each week. So, you know, I still, still have this huge passion for folks like myself that are, you know, new hunters or, or people from backgrounds that just aren't as, as generally associated with a hunting lifestyle. And, you know, that's still where my passion lies. And, um, you know, I, I so that's not going to be changing. Um, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just excited to kind of evolve this with my own personal journey. So, man, that's so cool. Yeah, it. Um, yeah, and getting going in in hunting or the outdoor lifestyle is really tough if your dad didn't do it or introduce you to it, or if you don't, you know, if mentors don't don't come either, like they're not your your friends that you have and and talk to all the time. Like it's it's um, overwhelming for guys and daunting and. Um, so I, I think you just provide such a good resource for guys to give them in the confidence, give them the confidence to get out there and enjoy the mountains that's out there for all of us to go enjoy. So man, I think it's a really cool deal. Yeah, again, just congratulations on the podcast and the rebranding and everything you're working on. So yeah, excited to see what the future holds for you. I definitely appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we'll see. It's only uh, it's all uphill from here. <laughs> it always is in, a, in in the good way <laughs> yeah right 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 um yeah it always is well i've i've really enjoyed getting to meet you uh thanks so much for taking the time and being on this morning i really enjoyed the conversation and we got to get you back on so after maybe one of these hunts this season uh we'll have you back on and talk about your experiences sounds good or maybe we can uh we can do one in person when i uh when i come out to montana this year oh man i'd love to sam yeah sounds like a plan 
Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Yep. You bet, man. We'll keep in touch and talk soon. Sounds good. All right, y'all. That'll do it for episode 104 of Living Country in the City. Make sure y'all head on over to the show notes page at livingcountryinthecity.com slash 104 to check out links to everything we talked about in today's episode. Big thank you to Brian for having me on the podcast. Really enjoyed being a guest. Make sure y'all head on over to Eastman's Elevated and give it a subscribe. But in the meantime, keep it country, y'all. Thank y'all for listening to Living Country in the City. Get show notes and check out the blog, product reviews, events, and more at livingcountryinthecity.com.